I'm really looking forward to hearing people's views on abortion, environmentalism, and immigration. The division makes me feel frustrated. A single news story can make me feel like I'm an expert on a topic, but a single discussion with someone who knows a lot more than me will make me very quickly realize I'm not. You just heard a clip from IDEOS Institute's documentary, Dialogue Lab America, premiering on January 5th as part of the National Day of Dialogue. Sign up to watch the film and join a nationwide movement of empathy and action. Visit www.nationaldayofdialogue.com. From the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State University, I'm Michael Berkman. I'm Chris Beam. I'm Jenna Spinelli, and welcome to Democracy Works. This week, we are excited to welcome back to the show Robert Talese of Vanderbilt University, who is joining us to talk about his latest book, Sustaining Democracy, What We Owe to the Other Side. And this book, I think, really gets at something we've been talking about on the show for a while now, which is, I think... Everyone agrees that there are aspects of democracy that are not doing very well and and haven't been for a while, but what's the path forward? Does it lie with individuals or with institutions? And what is the right combination of those things? And I think, as you'll hear, Robert very much thinks that the path is individual, and that lines up with what we've heard from Tom Nichols and perhaps others on the show this season. Yeah, Jenna, I think that's a nice way to frame it. what we've been hearing from some different people, obviously not everybody, but you know, some people focus on what you would think of as institutions, rules, uh, ways of organizing, party systems, uh, how politics are organized and how politics operate. And others, like I, I think this book clearly falls into this category, focus on people's behavior as citizens or how they think of themselves as citizens and argue that we can do better. And uh, as you mentioned, I mean, I last remember having this conversation around Tom Nichols' work. I've also had this conversation around uh, Chris Beam's work and other people that have been on the podcast. Uh, So what do you think, Chris? You agree with that kind of distinction? Yeah. I mean, you know, I was I tried to remember to look up the quote because I couldn't remember it exactly, but it's something like, Winston Churchill said about the the House of Commons that uh, we established Parliament and then the, the Parliament established us. And his argument was that, you know, once you establish these institutions, and, and the point is that because the two sides face each other, it, it encourages this kind of level of uh, acrimony, right? That they're, hey, 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 you know, everybody on my side says this and everybody on that side is going to disagree. And, and so I guess what I would say is that, you know, at some level, this is a false distinction, right? That you can't do, you can't really change infrastructure, political infrastructure without affecting culture and you can't affect culture without affecting infrastructure. And so it is just a matter of, of kind of where your emphasis is. And, you know, the people you mentioned, including yours truly, you know, the people who are kind of more theoretical tend to focus on, on culture and the people who are institutionalists focus on institutions. And, and obviously, uh, Talese falls into that uh, former category. Yeah, I mean, I think the distinction is meaningful because of where people put their analytical focus. And, you know, there's no doubt, I think Chris captured it pretty well, that culture, behavior, and culture is a very difficult concept to get a handle on, I think, is clearly shaped by incentives. They're shaped by rules. Uh, They're shaped by procedure. They can even be shaped by the way the room is laid out. You right. know, as, uh, and Chris makes an important point. The uh, British Parliament is laid out quite differently than the American Congress. The American Congress, in many ways, uh, really represents, I think, the separation of powers that doesn't exist in the British Parliament. You know, the other thing he does here uh, is talk about polarization. And I think we all agree that Talese does uh, a great job of framing up social science research. His description of polarization is not just him surveying it, but he's got data. And it goes back to some features of just human behavior that are going to manifest itself anywhere. But it's particularly relevant right now, right? Because that's where we are. And, you know, he talks about how 
uh, groups naturally kind of ratchet up and how um, it is almost, I think he talks about this in the interview too, right? Where there are, um, there are just, it doesn't matter what you're talking about. When you have a group that is all of one mind, they're going to become more extreme. And, and it really is clearly kind of a, a demonstrable in what we see in, in American society right now. Polarization is a reflection of a particular party system at a particular point in time. Party systems change, but they don't change that often. And when they do change, we, they, they have what we call realignments. And these realignments really shuffle politics because they shuffle what each party stands for, what the issues are that divide them, what the groups are that get behind them. What we're seeing now is a well-entrenched party system that dates back to probably the mid-1960s when the parties took dramatically different positions on the Civil Rights Act and started to pull apart. And this had all kinds of consequences throughout the political system. This is a pretty entrenched kind of thing, and it's not going away. And it's not going away because of the way politics are structured around these particular kinds of issues and the groups that have aligned behind them. And, and so I think anybody that really wants to talk about like what's going to, wh how does things change, you know, it has to be, it has to begin with a major change in the party system. And I think that comes about from crises or it comes about from the introduction of new issues. There are some other ways that it could come about as well. But until that happens, you know, I feel like talking about people behaving better or something, it's just not going to happen. Well, I think we have laid out some of the dynamics about individuals and institutions, and we know where you guys stand, and maybe we can come back and pick up on some of Robert Talese's arguments in the back half. But now let's go to the interview. Robert Talese, welcome back to Democracy Works. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Jenna, for having me back. So it has been uh, about two years since we had you on the show to discuss your book, Overdoing Democracy, which was out at the time. And you've been uh, quite prolific and have a new book out called Sustaining Democracy. Uh, I thought maybe we could start with perhaps some of the connections or lack thereof between those, those two books. What is kind of the, the through line and, and, and how has your thinking changed in these, these past couple of years? Good. Yeah. So I think the two books are connected and I see sustaining democracy as a kind of sequel to overdoing democracy. And here's how I understand the relation. Overdoing democracy argued that there are certain civic capacities that can be cultivated only when, in addition to political participation and activity, we reserve space in our collective lives for cooperative endeavors that aren't organized around politics. And one of the observations of overdoing democracy is that more and more of our social spaces are have become infiltrated by and coded by partisan affiliation. So it was becoming harder and harder to maintain and practice and cultivate those particular kinds of civic capacities because politics was saturating the, the social environment. When that book came out in 2019, I gave a lot of talks to various kinds of audiences uh, about the idea. And um, I don't know how many people I convinced, but maybe I convinced some people that, that the thesis is correct. But one question that I kept getting sort of went like this. The questioner would say, okay, you've convinced me. Or they might say, I'll, I'll grant you, we need more, more, we need to reserve space in our lives for uh, cooperative activities where politics is, is out of place. But when it is time to do politics, how should we proceed given all of the saturation of partisanship, the animosity, the hostility, the polarization, given all of the dysfunctional factors that are in play, how am I supposed to do politics when it's time? And it got me thinking, <laughs> 
that, you know, there's a, I think a pretty powerful and uh, formidable, you know, critique that is sort of internal to the office of democratic citizenship that we as citizens face when the political stakes are high, when the questions seem urgent, when we think that a lot is at stake in politics. And uh, that conflict has to do with sort of the, what I see as two directives for democratic citizenship. We've got to take responsibility for the political world around us or the parts of it that we have some influence over. And that means we have to participate and be active and vote and, and those sorts of things. But in addition to taking responsibility for politics, we also have a responsibility to our fellow citizens because they are our equals, even when we disagree with them about politics, right? Democracy is, you know, the project, the aspiration for a community of self-governing equals. And the responsibility to our fellow citizens entails that we have to consult with them, see, try to see things from their perspective, find out where our disagreements lie. We have to, in some ways, interact with them as citizens in ways that manifest our due acknowledgement of their equality. And the tension is that, and this is what the Sustaining Democracy book is all about, the tension has to do with the fact that, you know, political disagreements are not always, but are when, when they seem urgent and important, they're disagreements about what justice is all about. And so when we disagree about what justice is about, I don't, I don't see the other side as merely on the other side of the question. I see them as being on the wrong side. <laughs> I don't see them as being merely wrong about the political issue before us. I see them as in the wrong. And it struck me that maybe it was time to give a fresh analysis and exploration of the question of a kind of moral burden that I think lies at the heart of democratic citizenship that I don't think often gets enough, you know, gets enough attention, which is, you know, I have to treat as my equals fellow citizens who I nonetheless am bound to regard as agents of political injustice. And so the Sustaining Democracy book attempts to lay out that tension, which I think is not just theoretical. I think that we feel this. This is part of the phenomenology, we might say, of citizenship. We feel the tension when I say, why should I listen to or give a platform to or pay any regard whatsoever to my political opponents? After all, they are wrong. And if they get their way, justice will be set back. Why shouldn't I instead work with my allies to further justice? You know, I, I've been thinking as, as you were, were talking and even as I was reading the book, I wonder if this sustaining democracy sort of this this question or, or these lessons that you offer are perhaps more relevant now than ever because COVID-19 has brought politics into the places in our lives where it perhaps did not exist before. So I, I, I don't remember if we talked the last time you were on, but I, I play in a, in a community band. And so that I think would fit in your sustaining democracy model of a, of a space where you know people come together and, and politics is not at the forefront. But now, you know, we have to make decisions about masking and vaccines and all of these things that are both public health decisions, but also the, the way that they played out are sort of political decisions as well. And so I, I find myself thinking a lot about, is it still possible to have these, these spaces where politics is not front and center? And if that is the case, how should we kind of be, be approaching them you know, just knowing that in, in some level, this, you know, political undercurrent is going to be there in, in, in a way that it maybe was not before the pandemic. Yeah, I think that you're right, that a lot of these, let's just call them sort of tendencies for dysfunction, have intensified, I think, 
because uh, because of the pandemic, because of the uh, what we might think of as just sort of a crisis in sort of public understanding of public health. And one of the um, the angles that I uh, that that argument takes that I think is um, novel is that um, I try to show that the problem of polarization of incivility and hostility among citizens is perhaps most visible or legible as a problem impacting the relations between partisan opponents. That's where we see it, that's where we feel it, that's how it arises. But nonetheless, those same forces, cognitive and emotional or affective and otherwise, that trouble uh, our ability to see our foes, our political opponents, as nonetheless our political equals. Those same forces can foul our relations with our allies. And so one of the strategies in trying to make the case for sustaining democracy, even with one's political opponents, that I take up in the book is say, look, because the problem sort of becomes manifest to us in our relations with the other side, doesn't mean that the problem simply is the problem of treating the other side well. Forget about treating the other side well. In fact, I might even say in the book, I'm not sure, like you can still see them as your enemies. You don't have to do the Joe Biden, let's unify and bring the sides together. You can still have political enemies but you have a reason to try to sustain democracy with them, despite the fact that you see them as enemies, because as it turns out, heavily polarized groups become increasingly conformist. They become more and more invested in conformity, in a likeness. They become more like high school cliques that are focused ultimately on detecting posers. <laughs> You know. you know, as as we're talking about allies and, and maintaining that that sense of, of allyship and, and trying to find an understanding with people who hold different views, I, I wonder to what extent the sustaining democracy thesis is based on the fact that everybody involved in the conversation agrees that democracy is important or that in, in America, we actually do live in a democracy. You know, I think that democracy is an aspiration. I call it in the book, I think an aspirational ideal. And what renders a society a democracy is the extent to which its institutions and practices manifest or reflect that aspiration. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, the United States' um, democratic credentials are beyond question or challenge. They're, you know, they're not beyond question or challenge, right? I just wanna say, yeah, what makes it, what, what makes a challenge more than just a mere complaint is that you say, well, this particular, like the filibuster, for example, this particular institution or practice looks like it's a violation of a certain kind of understanding of how representative government works. That Now, whether you buy that criticism of the filibuster or not, I just want to say you have to see that as a criticism. Were it true that the filibuster runs contrary to a certain fundamental premise about representative uh, uh, democracy, what it means for office holders to represent constituents, that would have to be, you'd have to respond to that, right? You can't just, it's, it's something different from just saying, the filibuster makes it harder for me to get my way, so let's undo it. That's not a criticism, right? The criticism has to be a sort of an appeal to democratic ideals, aspirations, and then say that the existing practices and institutions aren't living up to them as well as they could or are violating in ways that we could fix. Okay. That's one thought. Here's the second thought. The argument of sustaining democracy does not require us to think that every political opponent counts as a democratic uh, foe. 
So I want to say there are some views, there are some positions that are, what I say in the book, beyond the pale of the democratic ideal. And I'm also willing to say, do say in the book, it is a kind of, this is a longstanding, you know, uh, uh, this goes back to Plato even, right? You know, there is an element of a democratic society that, and the way it organizes itself as a, as a, as a polity that invites democratic imposters, right? People who free ride, as it were, on democratic norms and vocabulary and institutions for the sake of diminishing, chipping away, undermining democracy. So I want to say there are certain views, certain kinds of citizens even who are beyond the pale. Then I want to say what to do about them and their views is a different question. So I, I kept thinking, I, I wrote it in, in my notes as I was going through the book, all this this introspection. And as you've just been articulating there, it's it's easy for a philosopher to say in, in some respects. So as we start to bring this from the, the realm of the, the theoretical into the practical, how might people start to think about behaviors or, or, or things that they could do or can, either you know individually or with others to try to put some of these ideas into practice? We tend to think, with good reason, right? yeah. we tend to think of um, democracy and interventions to repair or um, bolster it as residing almost exclusively in interpersonal political interactions. Now, I don't you know, re resist any of that. You know, I think that there's a lot of um, really exciting empirical work being done uh, in what I call in the book, sort of facilitated democracy. You know, deliberative polling, citizen juries, citizen assemblies, but I want to suggest that one of the other sort of essential features of democratic citizenship is really an internal uh, uh, matter. You know, John Dewey, uh, uh, who's a hero of many of us, uh, you know, has this brilliant little essay. It was a little address he gave called Creative Democracy, the Task Before Us, which I recommend everyone should go read. It's a really wonderful statement of very important elements of the democratic aspiration. Um, but I want to suggest that democracy is also a task within us. And that part of what's going wrong with democracy has more to do with the way we are comported towards our own political ideas. In fact, I want to suggest that some of the ways in which our political interactions with perceived opponents are going wrong, ultimately owe to a failure on our part to be adequately reflective in our own case with respect to our own ideas. Now, what I do want to suggest, though, is that in addition to the practices of hashing things out and joining with a group and getting your voice out there and being heard and carrying signs in the street and voting and calling up, you know, phone banking and all. In addition to all that democratic action, there needs to be democratic reflection. And I think that democratic reflection is largely a matter of hearing the other side, finding out what their views are, seeing where, you, where the disagreements lie, getting an accurate picture of the pro and con situation with respect to the questions of the day. That's part of it. I think there's another part of democratic reflection, though, and that's the acknowledgement of the fact, as I argue it is, that even if all of your political ideas are correct, there's still room for improvement. So I want to suggest that part of democratic reflection has to do with recognizing our own perpetual state of improvability with respect to politics. Last point on this, 
and this is the, the 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 thing at the end of the book that so the book is only out for a couple of weeks, but it's already the thing I've gotten the most pushback on. So, but a retreat from the fray of politics, uh, exposure to ideas and arguments and perspectives that are separated, that are detached from the politics of the moment. I think that there's a a particular kind of significance to our political thinking that emerges from encountering political ideas that are just not part of our own political landscape. That for, you know, there's a kind of set of political ideas that are irrelevant to our political travails of the moment. And encountering them has a kind of political relevancy all its own. But it did make me think about um, some of the work Danielle Allen and others are doing with the the Our Common Purpose project with the um, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And that's sort of, I think, in some ways, thinking about how to how to bring our institutions along on some of this, this project of, of making a, a, a democracy that's that's healthier and, you know, sustainable for everyone. And it just made me wonder, like, are there ways that institutions could help facilitate this democratic reflection, whether it's the way we think about the how these things are taught in schools, like what people lump under the, the civics education umbrella or other types of, of structural reforms that could perhaps work in concert with this, this democratic re uh, reflection. Yeah, so I see the end of the Sustaining Democracy book as the beginning of a, a kind of mainstream, but maybe unique in, in certain respects, a defense of humanities education. Now, you know, I'm all for the, some of the initiatives at least, uh, and some of the current initiatives about civics education and, you know, education for citizenship. I'm all for that. But I wanna say, look, there's something important for citizenship about, thinking through political matters that are not ours, right? You know, there's something important for citizenship of reading Thucydides, not for the sake of trying to say, look, here's Thucydides dealing with this and look, this is, he's dealing with or reporting on or the, you know, the Greeks are dealing with something that's a lot like what's going on today. You know, we've changed the landscape with democracy. I think that the focus on the here and now and sort of translating things into the present gets us stuck in the present. And I'm a doing in this regard, just like, you know, scientific, the democratic experiment cannot be, we cannot succeed at democracy if we're stuck. And when everything comes to us and is presented to us and we were train ourselves to think of everything in terms of the political categories and fissures and travails of the moment, we deprive ourselves of some real central democratic potency in the moment, which is the ability to understand the present as having latent within it a future that's not just more of the same and not translatable into the present, but is different because things have changed for the better. You know, I, we could keep talking about this for, for another hour, but we are going to have to, to leave it there. I, I always appreciate uh, your work. And, and I think that the perspective about taking that, that step back and, and trying to think about things in, in different ways will hopefully be uh, well received by our listeners. So thank you for um, the book, Staying Democracy, and thanks for joining us today to talk about it. Jenna, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to talk to you again. So I think I just want to start by talking about Talisa's argument, just to lay it out, just to make sure that um, we're, we're reflecting it accurately. He's arguing that there is this fundamental tension within democracy 
not democracy now, not American democracy in the 21st century, but democracy period. And the, and the, the problem is that on the one hand, we all have a vision of justice, of how we want to see the world, our society functioning, val- what it values, what it sees as important, what it achieves for its citizenry. And the other part of that democracy is that we have to accept as equals, as uh, equal participants in that democracy, people who not only don't agree with us, but who actually want to subvert, undermine, uh, wreck our conception of justice. And so he sees this as a, a dilemma that is part and parcel of any democracy anywhere. And his argument is, he says it's not instrumental. I think it's quite instrumental, actually. But that's, a, that's, a, that's an ethical, or that's, that's a parlor game for ethicists. But anyway, his argument is that if you do that, if you get rid of people and don't let them in, say that your conception of justice is so bad, so wrong, that it means I don't have to give you status as an equal participant in the democracy. It's just too important for this goal, right? If you do that, then you are opening the door for just cutting more and more people out. And you end up with an inability to sustain any kind of political coalition. Yeah. I mean... Nice summary of his argument. And I think that, you know, I know I was reading this and thinking, yes, <laughs> exactly. This is exactly the problem that I and so many people are having right now. It's like I having trouble accepting those with whom we disagree because it seems to be so wrapped up in so many issues and identities that are of critical importance to me or, or other people. And, and I, I thought he captured that really quite well. So the, 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 the weird thing about this book is that it is making an argument about democratic theory full stop, but it, it just leaves fallow the, the, the climate in which we find ourselves. And so, you know, he says, you know, no matter where you draw the line in terms of who is legitimately uh, a full, equal participant in this democracy and who isn't, right? Whether you say if you're uh, um, a neo-Nazi, you're out or whatever, right? He says there's going to be people who are still in who you are going to disagree with vehemently and who who are going to force this dilemma upon you. And I say, yes, you're absolutely right. But the question right now is not, what do we do about this abstract dilemma? The question is, what do we do about drawing the line right now? So, yeah, I mean, it was a frustrating aspect of the book. I mean, I don't blame the guy. He's writing a book and, you know, an insurrection takes place while he's in the middle of it. Um, and you could tell he's kind of trying to deal with it in the epilogue, but he also like got something kind of wrong because it was early. And that is, you know, it's like, oh, these white supremacists took over the Capitol and he, as a way of dismissing them. Mm-hmm. But actually, the more we've learned about the people that evaded the Capitol, rioted in the Capitol, how, whatever you want to say, were not necessarily white nationalists. There were white nationalists there. There was also the dentist from down the street. Mm-hmm. And the realtor who wants to sell you her house, who actually came in on her private plane. Right. And that empirically, we're finding that these are people that were professionally doing quite well. Uh, they were the kinds of people in your community you'd probably respect. That this was an, uh, an expression of their, their patriotism of their commitment to, you know, the American political system, that it, that it had been robbed and, and, and you know, subverted by this incredible uh, hoax and um, corrupt scandal. And my question is, that's about, you know, some, somewhere around 70 percent of Republicans believe that re- the, the election was um, stolen. And it just strikes me that there's simply no prospect for these people changing their mind. You know, if confronted with people that 
just don't accept basic democratic processes like the outcome of an election. Right. And who are going to keep insisting to, you know, some element of the population that the person they voted for only got there because they cheated and is illegitimate, then you know, you're going to just say, I can't work with these folks. Right. And how can I work with these people? And there'd be something rather depressing about that because he wants us to argue. He wants to argue. And, you know, while I don't necessarily see this as a way of reform, I certainly see this as an individual reading the book, as somebody who's involved and engaged. I was quite taken by what he said. Like, yeah, I do fall into that trap. I see exactly how that happens. Right. You know, it probably does require more self awareness on my part to catch this and to see what's happening. But I'm always going to run up against this idea. But the guy, you know, that would invade the Capitol and deny that we won the election and is going to try to overturn the next one is not somebody that I can really work with. I, you know, have a lot of sympathy for a lot of things he said. I think. The, art, the idea that reaction, immediate uh, visceral reaction to the position of your opponent is not universally the right response. Yep. That, and- that, it, that, that part of being a good democratic citizen is reflection, is thinking, <laughs> is reading, is conversing in non- you know, um, vituperative language, not, not because we all want to be nice and, and sing Kumbaya, but because part of, um, understanding and, um, confronting this reality, which we find ourselves in is, um, taking it seriously. Yeah. And at one point he's even going after protesters a little bit and yeah, take a step back. And, and I'm thinking, you know, if you're a woman and you just watched that hearing the other day, I don't think you really want to be told to take no. a step back. And I think that's, and, that's kind of where we are with the book, right? That that there's just too much going on right now to talk about this in the abstract. Yeah. And yes, and it, and it's very challenging. I, I, I appreciate what he's trying to do, though. And I, I do too. And I'm really sensitive to the idea, and I, I did just want to get this out, that you know, when I'm with a group of people that think kind of like I do, right, that – Rarely do our conversations take us in the more moderate direction. Yeah, I mean, it is, um, you know, I, I don't know if it's true for you, but it's true for me that when I'm in a group and a conversation is going on, making a point that is contrary or asking a serious question about where things are going um, is not met with um equanimity, let alone welcome. You know, it's like, no, we're, we're kind of enjoying this this ratcheting up. My only point, just to kind of put a a bow on this from the beginning, is that when I think about, you know, how to make things really different, okay, it requires changes at the top in institutions and the way political elites are operating and the incentives are operating and how politics are organized more so than it is in telling people that they have to act differently to be good democratic citizens, because I just don't know how that ever happens. No, I, you know, th- that is that is a clear dilemma, right? Because until the incentives change, it's unlikely that politicians are going to change. It's unrealistic to think there's going to change. But it's also, there's very little that's going to change incentives short of people not voting for these people any longer. And, and I don't know that that's going to happen either. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we're in a very difficult spot. And, you know, and I think it's also true that Talese lays out this um, dilemma in a way that, like you said, Michael, ref- uh, you know, resonates with all of us right now. And it's it's not illegitimate for us all to think about how we as individuals engage this reality and what kind of responsibilities we have on our own. Anyway, so, um, yeah, good, good stuff. Well, thank you to Robert Talese for, uh, for a really interesting book and a, and a good interview. And uh, Jenna, not easy to interview political theorists. <laughs> <laughs> so very nice job. I agree. I agree. Here, here. All right. Well, for the McCourtney Institute for Democracy, I'm Chris Beam. I'm Michael Berkman. Thanks for listening. 
Democracy Works is a collaboration between the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU, Central Pennsylvania's NPR station. Andy Grant is our producer, and our editors are Jen Bortz, Chris Kugler, and Mark Stitzer. Editorial review by Emily Reddy. If you liked what you heard today, please consider leaving us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find the show. Democracy Works is a proud member of the Democracy Group, a network of podcasts focused on democracy, civic engagement, and civil discourse. Learn more at democracygroup.org. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.